is what Malcolm X tells us at the end of the autobiography to work on some problem solving and some engagement in our culture and society and politics right now. And he tells us what to do and how to do it. Now, you might not agree with his views and his beliefs, but you might agree with some of his points and some of his ideas. So the goal would be to take it to the streets, so to speak, and try to broaden the audience for some of Malcolm's ideas as they come up in the end of the autobiography using social media because that's <laughs> kind of the only way we, we really have to spread and disseminate ideas in the absence of you know, face-to-face -face communities on campus. So that's just a thought and I wanted to put it out there. And as we discuss the end of the book today, feel free to jump in or ask questions or anything you would like to do to, uh, to tell me what you think about the usefulness of what we're discussing and how we might take it outside the confines of Blackboard Collaborate and of this classroom. So I see that Wendell is here, and I'll try to paraphrase really quickly what I just said. Wendell, can you hear me? Yeah, I didn't hear much. Wow. Trying to get my dogs inside. Okay. <laughs> You're trying to get your dogs inside? Yeah. <laughs> Got one of them. And the other one likes to patrol the yard. Yeah. Well, there's a harvest moon, so apparently there are lots of interesting things to patrol. As you can see, if you have your camera working, I have a dog in my lap and another one on the floor. So she's the reason why we can't have small animals in our yard because she's brought me rabbits, birds, mm -hmm. squirrels. She always brings them to me alive, but they're always terrified. Oh my gosh. And then are you able to set them free? Yeah, I usually have to get her inside so she can't see me set them free. But okay. she's always so proud of herself. Yeah. Yeah, my um, cat brings me dead things. So the cat brings dead little rodents all the time. But she, I was really sad the other day because she caught a chipmunk and killed it. And she was having a really good time with it, even though it was dead. And I love chipmunks, and the squirrels bully them so much that I felt badly. But the biggest uh, issue we have is that the poodle, who is otherwise a really wonderful dog, if you don't mind that she goes jogging loose around upstate campus all the time, the poodle can't resist the guinea pigs. So we have a guinea pig graveyard at our house. And the poodle, Cecilia, has murdered five guinea pigs and if, if PETA finds out they're just going to you know confiscate the rest of the hamsters and guinea pigs however yeah that's that's our fun and games for the morning so um, back to talking about the end of autobiography of Malcolm X I reading the end of it I'm always so moved that I want to spread the news and share the ideas and I was thinking that an interesting, non-conventional way that, especially for those of us doing the upper division form of the class, an interesting way that we could work on the project is to um, create some public social media discussions about some of Malcolm X's ideas. So. Uh, Leonard, you said you use Instagram and Facebook. Jared says he uses Facebook. And Tyler says no thank you <laughs> to social media. I think Instagram right now is one of the better integrated media with, uh, with what is going on in Upstate because 
the Instagram, to, to my knowledge, the Instagram accounts for multicultural affairs and for some of the student organizations, such as the NAACP, are pretty active. But I'm thinking about how we can use Facebook and Instagram to share some of the ideas that come up in the end of the autobiography, particularly in those last four chapters that I mentioned. So this morning, I would like to I'm going to, I'm going to tell you again exactly which chapters I'm talking about. Uh, I, I suggested that we focus on the last four chapters, which are out, and, and that's the chapter that he is silenced by the Nation of Islam <clears throat> and recognizes that several contracts have been put out on his life by Elijah Muhammad. And he leaves the Nation of Islam and he starts another organization called the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. The chapter Mecca describes his initial trip to the Hajj to do his pilgrimage. The chapter El Hajj Malik Shabazz is his description of travels throughout Africa. And although I think his international travels and experiences certainly create a very interesting framework for activism, I don't think we'll have as much time to discuss that particular chapter this morning. But then the final chapter, 1965, offers us a kind of journal -y. It sounds a little bit like a journal. It's a brainstorming of ideas about how the United States can cure the cancer of racism. So I'd like to talk about those four chapters today and then next week as we are discussing the film we can revisit some of the important parts of the autobiography from beginning to end that we haven't discussed yet in class because the film is pretty true to the text. And <clears throat> that'll give you time to catch up with the reading because this is over, you know, 450 pages. I find it very difficult to read in two weeks when your other professors think that online means more reading. <laughs> so um, do, do, before I start talking about those last four chapters with just a little bit more about out and then um, Mecca touching on El Hajj Malik Shabazz and focusing finally on 1865. Do you have questions or comments or thoughts? Okay, I will proceed then. Like I said, um, I have skipped out, but if we look at these flashcards, oh great, I can't retrieve my flashcards. Okay, I can't retrieve my flashcards, possibly because I'm using them on two accounts at the same time, but the flashcards that I made are the only way I can copy the text and we can move through the text. So, um, they are kind of my notes to help move through. To move through the text. So the first thing, actually I'm going to go back to the end of the chapter out, which we described, discussed briefly the other day, and look at a few moments at the end of and I'm not sharing my screen, but my screen's going crazy anyway.
So I've had to go back to Firefox on this stupid computer because I'm trying to, I thought they fixed the computer the other day and of course it's not really working. So I'm just going to close this out for a second and I will be right back on my computer because COINTEL Pro runs this computer. So I will be right back. I have my other computer opened already. Hello, I'm back, still with a dog on my lap. Sorry about that. As you know, COINTELPRO tries to stop us from making any progress. So I'm going to share the screen now. And fortunately, COINTELPRO, knock on wood, is not infiltrating my screen. And take you over to the text. Okay. So um, at the end of the chapter, which is called Out, Malcolm talks about how he has created a new organization having left the Nation of Islam. And he makes a press release announcement saying Muslim Mosque Incorporated will have its temporary headquarters in the Hotel, Hotel Teresa in Harlem, it will be the working base for an action program designed to eliminate the political oppression, the economic exploitation, and the social degradation suffered daily by 22 million Afro-Americans. I checked the census today, and today, according to U.S. Census data, there are about 44 million Afro-African-Americans. And he's, he talks about the black man as, as being 22 million in 1964 uh, in, a, in a somewhat later passage. So I wasn't able to double check yet to determine whether uh, there are 22 black men or 22 black people or if the population has doubled. My suspicion is that the population might have doubled since 64, but I am not sure about that. So um, nonetheless, his call to action here is something that I would like to propose we might engage with as well. And of course, he will say in these chapters that you don't have to be a Muslim to do this, that he invites all human beings to participate in this program. And it's an interfaith program. And the idea of eliminating political oppression, economic exploitation, and social degradation is, to me, a very valid project and a very broad project. Then he says uh, that he is in agreement 100% with racists to say that no government laws ever can force brotherhood. And therefore, he's in agreement also with perhaps Donald Trump, who has proclaimed that any kind of racial sensitivity training no longer needs to take place in government contracting or government agencies. 
I think that's the recent um, executive order, but I might be misspeaking slightly about that. So it's interesting because the faculty at Upstate have started to organize around trying to institute racial sensitivity training here, particularly for our faculty and administration. And apparently the president has said that it will no longer take place in any government agencies. So it should be interesting to see whether there's pushback if the faculty continue to request racial um, sensitivity. I don't love that term, you know, racial awareness and intercultural dialogue training. But um, so the government laws can't enforce it. And I don't think that's why Donald Trump wants to end it. But Malcolm X's point is that the only true world solution today is governments guided by true religion of the spirit. And this idea really blows me away because my research focus and, and the book that I wrote are very much about the antebellum era and about the abolition movement and cross-racial relationships and cooperation in the abolition movement. And if you know much about American literature, you might have heard of Ralph Waldo Emerson, for whom Ralph Waldo Ellison, the great African-American essayist and novelist, is named. But Ralph Waldo Emerson is known as a transcendentalist and the father of American literature. He has a fascinating and brilliant essay called Politics, in which he says we need a politics of love, because power only corrupts. It's only through brotherly love, sisterly love, through seeing the equal souls and spirits, the radical equality of souls, that the United States can move forward. And when Emerson says that, he means that as a means of overcoming nativism, anti-immigrant immigrant sentiment and racial oppression, particularly slavery. So Malcolm X reiterates this message a hundred years later and Audre Lorde, the great Grenadian American poet, makes similar points in one of her essays as well, shortly after Malcolm X makes the point. Hi, Hannah. It's okay. Oh, okay. Well, I had to turn off the computer because COINTELPRO is completely messing it up. So, um, what I'm doing here is if you, you have the actual copy of the book, right? Yes, I do. Okay. So, what I, I think what I'm looking at here is something um, that appears but I'm not sure at the end, toward the end of, they are not telling me where my flashcards are from. I think it's toward the end of the chapter out or um, toward the beginning of the chapter Mecca. But, but it's where he says that the only true world solution today to solve racism or to really have a just government is a government guided by religion of the spirit. And, and like he says in that interview that we watched on Tuesday, there is one God, and it's the Christian God, and it's the Hindu God, and it's the Buddhist God, and it's the Muslim God, and we all worship the same God. So he says that although uh, African Americans desperately need Islam because it emphasizes the role of Africa and people of African descent, in the spiritual world and also because Christianity has been used so much in the United States to justify slavery and subjugation. Uh, the white man's interpretation of Christianity has not brought the world very far, but even though he's still at this point kind of speaking against Christianity and against whiteness, the point that he makes about a religion of spirit is a very important one and and how that might or a politics really of spirit and a politics of love and how that would look 
Yes. And how bad and how corrupt. Yes. By a white Christianity that is hierarchical. Yes. And to a certain extent sometimes profit driven and and incorporated with political power. So he decides that he has to go to Mecca and he has to understand what he calls true Islam in order to spiritually cleanse himself enough to see what the future of political equality and social equality and economic fairness would look like. So he finds out that, of course, his sister Ella also wants to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And she's basically says she's been in and out of, put in and taken back out of the Nation of Islam as well. And he goes to Ella and he says, I need to make a pilgrimage. And she says, how much do you need? So anyone who says that Malcolm X is anti-woman is not paying attention to. He had to go to his sister, a woman. And he upholds Ella at every moment of transformation in his mo- in his life as the facilitator. And he says in that Ella is the one woman that, well, like he's the one directing women. Yeah. But Ella is the one that always directs women. Right. So that shows that he's not a misogynist. Right. Because if he has a woman, he has some interesting issues about sexual purity, but I, I don't think we can call him a misogynist. Now, to go a little bit further with his ideas about politics, which are really fascinating, it, um, he says also, and I'll, I'll find these page numbers and post them later because I'm going to make the, the quiz an after the class quiz and have kind of fill in the blanks for, for these quotes that are here on my flashcards. Um, he says, interestingly, conservative conservatism in America's politics means let's keep the N-word in their place. And liberalism means let's keep the Negroes in their place. But tell them we'll treat them a little better. Let's fool them more with more promises. With these choices, I felt that the American black man only needed to choose which one to be eaten by, the liberal fox or the conservative wolf, because both of, both of them would eat him. And he actually says in the election, the Goldwater-Johnson election, that he's not even going to bother to vote. And he would tell all black people not to vote. Yeah. Not, no one's running for black people to vote. Right. Um, and I don't want to take that message to the streets, but <laughs> you know, I want people to vote. Yeah. But I think the calling calling things out for what they are and saying our politics is corrupt because neither liberals nor conservatives have true equality in their even sites, even today, um, I think is something to think about. I also think there's some power in addressing that comment because let's say we start an organization for coalition politics at USC Upstate. I, um, you'll see why a little bit later on. It's important to me that that would not exclude white students or white conservative students or conservative students of any race. At the same time, we do have black student organizations and black nationalism, uh, as we just have already discussed, is important. And Malcolm gives a great explanation for why black nationalism is necessary and why whites cannot join his initial organization. In the competitive American society, how can there be white black solidarity before there is first some black solidarity? If you will remember my childhood, I've been exposed to the teachings of black nationalist Marcus Garvey, which in fact I have been told led to my father's murder. Even when I was a follower of Elijah Muhammad, I had been strongly aware of how the black nationalist political, economic, and social philosophies had the ability to instill within black men the racial dignity, the incentive, and the confidence that the black race needs today to get up off its knees, to get on its feet, get rid of the scars, and to take a stand for itself. Now, um, today we might still see that comment as a little bit condescending. Um, because to tell people to get up off their knees when you have a boot on your neck is is something that we might call into question or, or 
problematize, to use the fancy, silly academic word, problem, to make a problem up, to call into question. Cappy, did you swallow a bug? Yeah, Cappy doesn't like that comment. Um, so when he goes to um, speak to people throughout the world about, on his trip to Africa, he says they had been aware that the plight of the black man in America was bad, but they had not been aware that it was inhuman, that it was a psychological castration. These people from elsewhere around the world were shocked. As Muslims, they had a very tender heart for all unfortunates and very sensitive feelings for truth and justice. And everything I said to them, as long as we talked, they were aware of the yardstick that I was using to measure everything. That to me, the Earth, the Earth's most explosive and pernicious evil is racism, the inability of God's creatures to live as one, especially in the Western world. So in contrast to his idea of the politics of love and of the spirit, we have the pernicious evil of racism. And this new definition of racism is the inability of God's creatures to live as one. So that uh, shakes up our previous definitions as well. He writes to his friends that he has had enough of someone else's propaganda. He says, I'm for truth, no matter who tells it. I'm for justice, no matter who it is for or against. I'm a human being first and foremost. And as such, I'm for whoever and whatever benefits humanity as a whole. And again, in terms of black nationalism, that sounds like it could be almost contradictory. He, um, but, but you don't have to be anti-white to be pro-black. You don't have to be less devoted to humanity to be pro-black. And, and, and that's something that needs to be part of the conversation much more broadly in the United States today. Um, and for what, whatever benefits humanity as a whole, well, to have complete equality and respect and recognition for different cultures, as far as, I, as far as I'm concerned, is what's going to save humanity. Yep. So white people who are racist are, are really hurting themselves, as well as um, causing tremendous damage to the nation, in particular uh, damage to certain it's communities. So like, when they're racist, they're saying stuff in the they are just shutting themselves off. It's like somebody yeah. you about people. Right. Like you're There's a great line at the end of one of the chapters where someone driving by says, hey, do you mind shaking hands with a white man? And he says, hey, um, I'll shake hands with any human being. Are you a human being? And so to, to, um, to voice those two things simultaneously is something that I think helps us get past the Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, Any Lives Matter, artificial controversy. You know, yes, Black Lives Matter. And yes, um, we need to, for the benefit of humanity as a whole, recognize that Black Lives Matter. He talks about revolution, which is destroying an old system and replacing it with a new system. And is that possibly what could be happening now? Um, the Algerian Revolution, throughout the French who had colonized them for over a hundred years. Uh, how does anybody talk about blacks in America waging revolution? So far, people are just condemning a system but not trying to overturn it. And certainly, King didn't try to overturn the system or to destroy it. The revolt is merely asking to be accepted into an existing system. A true revolt might entail fighting for separate black states, which several groups and individuals advocated long before Elijah Muhammad. Now, Malcolm no longer believes in having the separate states. However, he does believe in radically changing the system from the politics of power to a politics of love. So we have to keep asking, what is that? How would it look? How could we do it? When at the beginning, so now I'm at the beginning of the chapter, which is Mecca. And as soon as he realizes that he needs to make the pilgrimage, he goes to the office of a man 
called Dr. Shawarbi, who has the responsibility of authenticating or authorizing the petition of any American convert to Islam to make the pilgrimage because you have to be a true Muslim to go, yes. And so if you're, they, they particularly don't want the Nation of Islam. They don't want uh, the Nation of Islam in part because the Nation of Islam doesn't follow the Quran and doesn't follow the practices and traditions of the religion. So he gives, so Dr. Sharabi gives him the letter and then he gives him a book which is called The Eternal Message of Muhammad by Abdal Rahman Assam. And you can read this book because we do have here a free download available. They ask you to purchase it if you can, but it says, please consider buying books at full price as a way of supporting this organization. But you can also um, you can also I'm quite sure read the book for free if you if you don't want to purchase it or possibly even look at it. So I, I believe you can look at the digital copy of this. If not, there is there are PDFs and available copies of it to understand this particular religious model, perhaps, of a politics of love. And I'm going to now go back to the example. So he gets his letter, and he has to constantly answer these questions about um, whether or not he agrees with violence. And he says, I am for violence. If nonviolence means we continue to postpone the solution to the American black man's problem, just to avoid violence, I don't go for nonviolence if it means a delayed solution. To me, a delayed solution is a non solution. Or I'll say it another way if it must take violence to get the black man his human rights in this country, I'm for violence exactly as you know the Irish, the Poles, or the Jews would be if they were flagrantly discriminated against. I am just as they would be in that case. And they would be for violence, no matter what the consequence is, no matter who was hurt by the violence. So that is a, that's a, that is a, a little bit more militant statement. And that is kind of the logic of the American Revolution as well. I think um, when he, he makes a he makes a speech shortly after called the ballot or the bullet, which is a really amazing speech, and he he's not really consistently advocating violence before electoral process, um, but you know that's just what he said at that particular moment. Also, because he seen so much and with so much against him, right? Like someone's gonna violence. Right. I feel like that's another aspect of the saying that. Right. He's not going to advocate it, but he's not just going to stand there and take it either. And another thing that I think is important to, to consider when he talks about violence, he's not necessarily talking about attacks, he's talking about physical shows of power. Mm -hmm. So when one of the Muslim brothers is beaten by the police and thrown in jail, and it's a great scene in the movie. All of the men in the Nation of Islam march out in their bow ties and their suits and take a stand, and the police back down. And shortly after the movie, Malcolm X came out, the, um, the Nation of Islam is still pretty active in Philadelphia, and I was living in Philadelphia. Nelson Mandela came to Philadelphia, and I went to see Nelson Mandela speak at every possible uh, every possible you know opportunity. So I saw him speak at Independence Hall next to the Liberty Bell, and I saw him speak at the YMCA in West Philadelphia. And the security detail was the Nation of Islam. And so it was the same thing that you saw in the movie, if you remember the scene where the men kind of march out in single file 
and the Black Panthers would take up wearing leather jackets and black berets, a similar kind of display of what looks like, you know, a military discipline and power. Um, and it's so, it's not what we normally think of as a display of violence, but it's a display of physical power and don't mess with me. <clears throat> In contrast to that, his depictions of the Muslim world and the politics of love and of the spirit kind of begin with when he talks about the, the rug. And he's at the airport still, and he talks about how Muslims use their rugs. They, um, they pray on their rugs. Then they put a tablecloth over the rug and it becomes the dining room table. They take away the dishes and the cloth and they sit together on the rug and it's their living room. They sleep on the rug and it's their bedroom. And it can also be a courtroom or a classroom. And he realizes why oriental rugs have such a high value when he was a burglar. Because these rugs are made so well because they serve every possible purpose. And I think the rug here is kind of a metaphor of you don't need a lot to have the kind of community and connection that he's advocating. And you, you know, and you can take it anywhere, but you need something, a strong fiber, a fabric to hold together your values and your connection. So I really like that passage about the book. Then um, the book that he received from Dr. Shawabi by Dr. Azam, um, he, he re he's not able to go to Mecca because even though he does have a letter authenticating his trip, they hold him at the airport for a few days until he realizes he can call Dr. Azam. And Dr. Azam's son comes to get him, and he's, he emphasizes a couple times that he's dressed in two towels. And one of them is like a loincloth or a diaper, and the other one is simply over his shoulder, and he's wearing these sandals because he's had to kind of strip himself down to the bare minimum almost nakedness in order to go through this conversion that he's undertaking. You know, he's kind of going back to being like a baby. And the man who has come to help him, who he doesn't know, um, looks like a white man, and he's a descendant of royalty, and, you know, he's a very elite and privileged person. But he is overwhelmed by the hospitality and kindness and warmth that he receives from these white-looking, very powerful Muslims in Egypt. Um, when he talks about the Nation of Islam, and these flashcards, I'm sorry, they're kind of jumping all over in different parts of the chapters. His personal disappointment is that the Nation of Islam does not engage in politics. It has a policy of non-engagement. And if the Nation of Islam engaged and took part in freedom movements and showed up at, at marches and rallies, there would be a little bit more structure. Um, he says militantly disciplined Muslims should be there for all the world to see and respect and discuss. And, you know, it, it is a, it's a spectacle almost that does deserve respect. And I think that would be really helpful right now in the um, difficulties that are coming about from white supremacists infiltrating the rallies and acting as agent provocateurs and promoting the violence and rioting that takes place occasionally when demonstrations turn into diff entirely different kinds of events. So, So after he meets Assam, he starts to, even after his flight to Egypt, when he meets this white student from France who, um, so Sean, yeah, yeah. That was really Bruce. I, this is unbelievable. Yeah. He was like, yeah. yeah, it's me. Um, it was, he says, it was when I first began to perceive that white man as commonly used means complexion only secondarily, 
Primarily, it described attitudes and actions. In America, white man meant specific attitudes and actions toward the black man and toward all other white men. But in the Muslim world, I had seen that men with white complexions were more genuinely brotherly than anyone else had ever been. So here, he's really talking about the social construction of whiteness in the United States. And I find it very encouraging that um, he's also suggesting then that we can say no, those of us who are born known and deficient, we can say no to being white and kind of renounce whiteness, which to me is a really important idea. He goes to Ghana, he meets um, W.B. Du Bois' widow and gets to go to her home. Now I mentioned earlier that I think Malcolm X read Du Bois and that Du Bois also influenced his thinking. And here, he, when he talks about not actually getting to meet Du Bois, because Du Bois had moved to Ghana, um, that going to his home and meeting his wife really moved him. The militant Afro-American scholar who was treated like a king by Kwame Nkrumah, giving Dr. Du Bois anything he could wish for in Ghana. When Dr. Du Bois was failing fast, Dr. Nkrumah visited and the two men said goodbye, both knowing that one's death was near and Dr. Nkrumah had gone away in tears. And, and note here, he calls W.E.B. Du Bois the militant Afro-American scholar. So, you know, what does he mean by violence and what does he mean by militant? W.E.B. Du Bois never raised his fist to anyone. However, Du Bois did write about the Haitian Revolution and the Haitian revolutionaries very powerfully. He wrote about John Brown, the white man who um, was inspired by the Haitian Revolution to try to bring justice to the United States. So we have to question what militant means. He meets also a colony of expatriates, which mean Americans living in Ghana, who are there to kind of help him make his tour of Ghana, his homecoming. So in what seemed at no time at all, he was in Mayfield's home, surrounded by 40 black American expatriates. They had been waiting for him. They were business and professional people, such as the militant former Brooklynites. And again, militant, you know, what does that mean? Two dentists. Well, okay, dentists are militant. <laughs> they pull out your teeth. But people who renounced their U.S. citizenship and went to uh, Ghana, including Maya Angelou. And Maya Angelou, who you may know for her poetry and for her autobiography, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which brings us back to the Dunbar poem, was a close friend of Malcolm X. So if you watch um, Still I Rise, the documentary about Maya Angelou, she talks about, uh, she talks about Malcolm X quite a bit. And she clearly knew Malcolm as these last chapters tell us about Malcolm and this really important way that all of us should know Malcolm and kind of think about his memory right now as we work toward keeping the momentum of activism and equality alive. And a set of ideas and definitions that are still very, very useful to us. Mm -hmm. So that's why I made these flashcards. Um, he tells, I don't remember who he tells, even though I just made these, but what you are telling me is that it isn't the American white man who is a racist, but it's the American political, economic, and social atmosphere that automatically nourishes a racist psychology in the white man. The American black leader's most critical problem is lack of imagination. His thinking and strategies, if any, are always limited to only that which is either advised or approved by the white man. And the first thing the American power structure doesn't want is any blacks to start thinking internationally. 
what Garvey thought internationally and with what happened to him. <laughs> so this is where um, Malcolm X is ahead of his time because he understands that we're, we're in a global world here, you know? Um, he's not letting go of the individual side of life to put on it. He's going to think of that. Yeah. So he talks about Christianity and colonialism in Africa, um, starting with missionary activity under the banner of the cross, conquering, killing, exploiting, pillaging, teaching white supremacy. This is how the white man thrust himself into the, into the position of leadership of the world through the use of naked physical power. And he was totally inadequate spiritually. Mankind's history has proved from one era to another that the true criterion of leadership is spiritual. Men are attracted by spirit. By power, men are forced. Love is engendered by spirit. By power, anxieties are created. And that, um, that, that's kind of blowing my mind because he has also said he is not against violence. So what does violence mean if it's grounded in this spirit that he has invoked? Now, there is a there's an historical kind of political science and philosophical tradition in this grounding in spirit and politics of love because Ralph Waldo Emerson, for example, gave money to John Brown. He paid for some of the guns that John Brown would try to use in bleeding Kansas. But he was an advocate of the politics of love. There's uh, one of my favorite films is by some Jesuit priests and it's about colonization in South America. And it's about a Jesuit priest who tries to save a mission that is truly a spiritual mission among indigenous people in the rainforest. And um, it, you can only guess how that goes. But the difference between forcing yourself and using power that is a physical show of power, naked physical power, versus perhaps spiritual power. You know, um, when, when Malcolm X talks about using violence, I don't know how he could possibly be talking about the same violence that is this naked physical power that whites have used to colonize and against people of color and still do. I don't know how Malcolm X could advocate that form of violence. And, and he clarifies later to say he's talking about self-defense, you know, being up to fight back and having your gun by any means necessary, right? But um, how can you know how can you have this politics of love and spirituality the spiritual power without violence well he talks about psychological castration that's yeah. right there's that psychological violence as well that um yeah so so show so and and it is true that very often just showing that you're strong and you're not afraid very mm -hmm. often but not always i mean it certainly has not been the case for a lot of african-american fighters i'm thinking of um shoot the first black heavyweight champion and his show of strength and power in the early um 20th century got him deported too. Uh, no, oh no, no, I'm talking about in the early 20th century. The um, documentary is called Unforgivable Blackness. Wendell, do you, did you ever see Unforgivable Blackness?
I'll remember, I'll remember his name as soon as he passes over. Anyway, um, so I'm, I'm really curious and I want to know more about this, this form of power and how that correlates with self-defense and, and what does that look like? Because Americans' racism is among their own fellow whites. That's where the sincere whites who really need to accomplish something have got to work. So this is, a, this is another call to action. And he um, talks about the young woman who came to the restaurant, to the Nation of Islam restaurant in New York City from her college in New England and said, hey, I want to help. What can I do? And he, and he told her, go away. You can't do nothing. Don't do anything. And like I said, I, I've um, been told something to that effect before as well. And I feel like that's so harsh because you're trying, you're not doing it in an arrogant way like with white um, racist people would, like, oh, well, what the, like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're trying to advocate and help. It's like now, today, what we, what the Black Lives, Black, Black Lives Matter movement means is people like you that are from, that are white, that are saying, no, this is going to hit you both sides. Well, I think I also have to prove myself and earn people's trust. Yeah. So if someone tells me nothing and I, I keep trying and I don't do any of the things that would make me impede black leadership, then um, I, I get to <laughs> continue on and I won't be told to go away again. But to a certain extent, you know, telling someone the first time to go away is a good test of character. And and I don't think that there is grounds for trust in the United States between all racial and ethnic groups. I think we have to earn that. So um, at the same time, I feel like a hypocrite when I say this, and I think I have said before, and it may have sounded weird to all of you, that I'm pretty happy that there there is a diverse group of people in this class there are um, white and Indian and black and possibly other uh, ethnic groups that I am not recognizing and I apologize for that because as a white person, I don't need to preach to the choir. You know, I don't need to tell black students all the time that black nationalism is good because it promotes <laughs> social, economic, and political progress. It is really important that I try to accomplish something and do some work. And Malcolm X says this, and Steve Biko says this, and, and I think it is a really important chart. Now, um, that said, last night I did a talk for the first year reading program, and like I said, Mac participated in it, and it, it was more about Mac telling a story about a macroaggression, and um, you know, me just kind of setting the stage for a conversation between him and, and other students. But there was some interest in white becoming a white ally and in coalition politics among those first year students. And there was a really nice conversation that because um, math is just such a, a wonderful and kind of accessible, you know, um, charismatic guy that it, it just went really beautifully, and I'm so grateful to him for that. But there's there's work to do among white students, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because the white students in this class already know that African American literature and culture are valuable. But that's why I have also suggested, like, what if we try to start building what we know and reaching out and, and creating, and I know you're in a cross-racial relationship anytime you walk in a room because there are <laughs> there's only one other Indian woman student that I know in upstate there might be more than just two but you're used to being in that you know that um, hybrid space yeah. Yeah, I mean, all my ethnicity, 
I mean, mm -hmm. my girls, when I was doing brunch, I went up to one of the black sororities and I was looking at it and they were like, you're not dark enough. And my mom, who's white, looked at me and I was like, I don't think you can pass a paper bag test. That's, yeah, that's very, that's strange. Um, so this is the last flashcard now. And the last flashcard is, is really ominous because toward the end of the chapter called 1865, 1965, sorry, um, 2065, he says, each day I live as if I am already dead and I tell you what I would like for you to do. When I am dead, I say it that way because from the things I know, I do not expect to live long enough to read this book when it's finished. I want you to just watch and see if I'm not right in what I say. That the white man in his press is going to identify me with hate. And, and what Malcolm X asks us to do is to take down those myths and misrepresentations of hate and to try to share his message of love and of a spiritual connection among all human beings and of the oneness of humanity. And even if you are not religious or spiritual, I think most people agree that we are one human race. You know, if you're a humanist rather than a, a religious person, not that you can't be both. So, so he's asking us here and he's, it really sh it shows me because he knows that the world doesn't really have room for him. And he knows that somebody's going to kill him. And King also knew. It's so sad that they really know. I've noticed, like, I'm going to die. Someone's going to accept it for life. Yeah. I, w I was so anxious about um, Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of people did yeah. He, I think he had a security detail that surpassed anything ever. I think he had the he definitely had the best security. Yeah. So, so next week um, your your assignment is to watch the film and I if I haven't already put that link, we do have a link so you can stream it for, for free. And well, we can watch clips of it in class to connect with some of the things we want to talk about. But I am interested in the call to action, and I am interested in what it would mean for us to possibly use social media or whatever platform, whatever platforms we would like to take what is useful and good in Malcolm's message and in his story and think about whether it will contribute to making our lives better right now. So that's just something really big to think about. I'm going to go back to the screen here. Last week I only like one-tenth jokingly called on the white people in particular in the class <laughs> to, um, you know, to, to become allies and to work for social change. So I'm going to continue, and, and you know, you don't, you don't have to do that, but um, an option certainly for the work we do in this class can be public and, and activist and dialogic. We don't have to just do the kind of traditional assignments where you're essentially creating assignments that I read, like the first paper. So that said, what questions do you all have? Hopefully I will have the quiz ready by tomorrow. And I will probably also make um, a quiz about the, um, this, when we were listening to the music, you know, and some of the cultural references that Malcolm was making about Harlem, I'll probably add some of that because I would like to make 
the quizzes incorporate the videos and the listening that we were doing. I have now realized that people tend to do their online classes through the gradebook, which is disastrous for the way that I set up classes. But I'm, I'm going, I want to experiment a little bit with creating materials that pull you into a multimedia world of the class and the community. So, so questions? Requests? Criticisms? Book service announcements? All right, everybody. I will see you next week. Have a great weekend. I don't know, I went to that on 11.